What's up, YouTube? We are about to go live to finish our, well, not to finish, to do our second last episode on this pull-up uh, train that we uh, got sidetracked on last week because we had a legendary hand balancer in here and we wanted to get an interview with him. So stick around because in the next minute or two, we are going to be going live and talking to you about some amazing ways to get your first pull-up or get better at pull-ups if you're not that good at them. So you wanna master the pull-up. Well, in this show, we are gonna show you some amazing techniques for how to nail that all-elusive pull-up. Now, make sure you stick around to them because we're gonna reveal a really big mistake that people are making that is gonna to totally stifle your progress if you're doing it. All that and more, coming up. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. In case we haven't met, hi, <laughs> sorry, I just got a delayed signal there. Hey everyone, in case we haven't met, my name is Rad Burmeister. I'm one of the owners of Unity Gym and the co-creator of the UMS, the Unified Movement System, where we teach you how to be absolute superhumans. We take driven people and make them super strong and super flexible. And the way we get such astonishing results with our members is that we've created a program that has a balance between strength and flexibility. Now, if you wanna know how we do that, the best place to get started is to download our free flexibility blueprint. There's a link in the description of this video. Now, as always, I've got Phil White with me, our resident physiotherapist and all round good looking dude. How you doing, Phil? Uh, I'm feeling a bit uh, off with my moustache getting, <laughs> taking so much of the screen at the yeah, moment. It's yeah, really, yeah, uh, it's getting there, man. Yeah, a bit off, but uh, yeah, wonderful weekend. Had a, um, a good time on a Friday night doing a biathlon in Manly. So if anyone lives in the Northern Beaches area and wants to do a bit of swimming and running on a Friday night, 6.30 down at Shelley Beach, see you there. Yeah, yeah, so, hit him Good up. weekend. Mm, yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a good weekend. You were right, living the dream. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we did a handstand workshop here. It was awesome. So yeah. that was a lot of fun with Kyle Wigger. If you didn't check out the episode, have a look last week at our Friday episode on uh, the four key elements to a handstand. It was really, really insightful. A lot of good lessons there for you if you want to learn how to do a handstand. Yeah, absolutely. But excited to be back. Excited that we get to keep going with this pull-up question, uh, pull-up series because we've had some really good questions over the weekend. And um, yeah, yeah, so. for sure. Which we'll get to soon. What I want to start with is saying, if you're watching, please hit the like button and comment with your name and where you're watching from, so we can give you a shout out. And also, of course, we want to know what methods of pull-ups have you been using? What programs have you followed? What methods have you used? And did they work? Was it successful or was it not successful? So please leave a comment. Uh, in the comment section here so that we can respond to you and uh, hopefully give you some help to get you going a little bit further forward. Um, now today, the key insight for today is how to use eccentric contractions and isometric contractions in order to create phenomenal strength and bust through plateaus. This is the big difference where we get people who've never been able to do pull-ups before to being able to do pull-ups with these two techniques. It's really amazing because isometric loading, it, what the way we use isometrics is that we create an isometric hold at the top, which creates more strength in that top chest to bar position. And then we use eccentric loading because you're 150% stronger or 100 150% of the strength, give or take, that you have with concentric strength, so it allows people to actually get some time under tension uh, going through the full range of motion with so that. For those playing at home who maybe haven't heard of these terms before, isometric means that when you're contracting, you're just holding against, um, you're just not moving, but you're contracting against a force. Uh, eccentric is your lengthening under tension. So, um, you know, if you're when you're sitting down to sit into a chair, you're sitting down, you're quads going through an eccentric contraction mm -hmm. and then a concentric is when you're pushing against a force so yeah. um and yeah contracting so yeah. Yeah. standing up yeah, and I, I find a lot of people struggle to understand the difference between concentric, eccentric, and isometric. And I think there's 
I found that there's different ways to explain it that help yeah. people. So another way to explain it is concentric is when the muscles are shortening, when yeah. you're contracting. Eccentric is when the muscles are under tension, but they're lengthening. And isometric is when the muscles are under tension, but they're neither shortening nor lengthening. Yeah. Um, and just the difference there with eccentric versus stretch is with an eccentric, you're like with a stretch, you're lengthening as well, but you're passive, you're relaxed. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're lengthening, but you're contracting against it, yeah. then that's an... That's yeah. what eccentric is. So if you're on a pull-up and you're at the top of the bar and you lift your legs and you slowly go down to the ground, that's an eccentric contraction. If you pull yourself up to the bar, that's a concentric contraction. And if you held yourself at the top and didn't move anywhere, that's an isometric contraction. Yeah. So we go have a yeah, look at that have a look. Yeah. Yep. So Phil's got the mic here. Uh, I'm going to be a demonstrator. I've checked that it's on. So things are, things are looking up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And we got a... Uh, Got Kyle out here as well from the weekend for those who um, <laughs> remember him from last week. So we're going to have a look at some uh, different styles of uh, pull up here. So this is going to be our be beginner starting out one. So I'm just, can I say something? Real yeah. Quick? I love having a barbell like this here to do these exercises, and I'll tell you why. I don't like having to jump because when you have to jump, have a look at how much my body flails around. So if I go here and I try and do an isometric contraction here. And I'm very good at that. That's something that I've done a lot of work on. People that aren't as good at it as I am, they're flailing around everywhere. Whereas when I do this, I can just be really, you know, where I want my body to be and not swinging around. So I really like to have a bar at about shoulder height. Yep, 100%. Uh, so less, less variables, less to control at the beginning. So what he's gonna do is starting off, remember what we, we've talked about with the scapular positioning. So he's gonna bring his chest to, chest to the bar first up. So that's setting up that nice isometric contraction through your lower traps to start it. And now, as he's starting to lower down, he's just taking a bit of the weight, taking his weight off his feet and trying to maintain as he goes down. So he's just um, pulling nice and tight through the arms and just lengthening under that tension. So that's the eccentric contraction we're talking about. Now, if you think about what's happening at the lower traps, that's actually, uh, and the uh, rhomboids, that's actually an isometric contraction throughout. So he's not letting them uh, come up into that hunched position. So. Uh, if this is too hard for you and straight away you just drop to the ground, then you can put a bit of the weight through your feet and then just control it down like that. So really nice way that you can adapt it as a beginner and then as you get stronger, you'll be able to take less and less weight through your feet and then to the point where you have your whole body weight. So that's our first one. And an isometric one. And so now for the isometric, what he's going to do is, is once you, he's able to like overcome that force, is hold that position for as long as he can. Now notice he's keeping his shoulders nice and down. Maybe just show us what it would look like if you were, yeah, <laughs> so that's what it commonly looks like with your shoulders up and down. Uh, so we want to try and keep shoulders back and down, chest to bar and holding that position. And I'm gonna go a step further. You don't want to keep your shoulders down. It is critical that you keep your shoulders down. If you're not keeping your shoulders down, you are doing this completely wrong and you must regress it. And the way you regress it is to take some weight out of your feet. So anyone can, I can stand here with my two little fingers on this and go like that because now I've got 100% of my weight in my feet. So the idea is put your shoulders in the right position and then take as much weight into your arms as you can by taking some weight out of your feet. And the second your shoulders start going like that, it's too much. Yep, got it up. Yeah. Cool, cool. Want to go head back, back in. in. Yep. All right. So for those, let us know if you've um, tried that out and maybe if you, tell us about your, your setup as well. If you've only got a, a bar that's, you know, up at door height, that might be a bit challenging, but there's definitely different ways that we can, we can get yeah, around that. Look, I get that for a lot of people, especially if you're training outdoors and you don't have access to a gym, you're not going to have a barbell like that. But if you can step up to a bar yeah. and then lift your legs gently rather than jump up to it, yeah. um, that's my preferred method. But that said... Do it however you can. The more you practice, the more you'll learn movement and the more you'll be able to control yourself so you're not swinging around like that so much, yeah. But I cannot emphasize to you enough how important it is that the scapula stays depressed when you do that. So when you're doing an eccentric rep, so the isometric can, uh, rep is, is pretty simple. It, and that might, doesn't mean it's easy, but it's simple. Just pull your shoulders down, touch your chest to the bar, Take as much weight in your arms as you can and gradually take the weight out of your feet until you get to a point where you can probably hold it for, to get started, a good starting point would be to hold it for about 20 seconds on each set and you'd do three sets of that for 20 seconds and then you gradually want to get to a point where you can take your feet off the ground. The eccentric contractions are a lot more complicated. Now this is a really important key insight for you today. 
understand what I'm about to say now and your pull-ups are going to get so much better. There's three variables that you think of with eccentric contractions. Number one is how long the contraction goes for. You want to start with at least three seconds. If you can't do three seconds of eccentric loading, you need to put your feet on the ground a little bit so that you at least get three seconds. You don't want to just drop to the ground. So the first thing that you want to do is try and get up to 10 seconds per eccentric contraction. That means from the time that you lift your feet off the ground to the time that your arms are completely straight, it should take 10 seconds. Now that's one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. Time what 10 seconds looks like on a clock. I'm not talking about 10 count where you just go one, two, three, four. It's, I'm talking about 10 proper seconds. The second variable is that you want to try and get, um, actually that was the second variable. I should say the first variable is that you want to get uh, between three and five reps, okay? So you never do more than five reps of eccentric loading and that's because of the way that if you do more than five reps, you're really moving into endurance training and pull-ups are not an endurance exercise, it's a strength exercise. So first thing, try to get up to five reps, even if each rep is only three seconds on the way down. Once you can do five reps, try to make each rep go for 10 seconds. If that means you drop back to three reps and do 10 seconds, that's fine, and then try and build up to five reps for 10 seconds per rep. And the third variable is a zero second pause between reps. So once you can get those five reps of 10 seconds, um, eccentric, you wanna do no pause between reps. Once you can get between three and five reps with those variables, you should be able to do one concentric repetition. Most um, the, of the research shows that when you can do three to five reps of 10 seconds with no break, you should be able to do one concentric repetition. And once you can do that, you start doing hybrid sets. And hybrid sets are what we're gonna talk about tomorrow. I'm gonna teach you guys how you use that. Um, anything you wanna add to that, Phil? Yeah, just when you're starting out with something like this, especially with eccentrics, uh, that is the thing that's most likely to cause you DOMS, so delayed onset muscle soreness. So if you start doing this, just be prepared that the next day, if you haven't done this kind of um, uh, strengthening before, that it's very likely to, to cause you some soreness. So that's totally normal and it should resolve in a couple of days. But just, you know, don't want people going out there and <laughs> being like, ah, oh, you've broken my yeah. arms because yeah. there's, you know, suddenly a lot of pain. So yeah, um, yeah the e eccentric loading, because you are lengthening under tension, you're able to, uh, you know, deal with a higher weight than you would with, with the pulling, uh, with the concentric weight. It means that, yeah, you're getting that lengthening under tension where you get micro muscle tears, which is actually what causes adaptation and causes you to get stronger. So yeah. it's uh, an expected thing that you should be a little bit sore and feel like you've done something the day before. So remember with your programming, we'll go into more programming tomorrow, but yeah. you just wanna make sure you're giving yourself you know, rest days so you're actually getting that good recovery because if you're just doing this day after day, then you won't progress as fast as if you give yourself a rest day and give yourself time to adapt and recover. Yeah. And I'd recommend uh, 72 hours rest between pull-ups. Um, I think twice a week is, uh, more than enough for pull-ups if you're doing sets um, three to five sets unless you want to do something like where you do grease the groove where and you can do grease the groove it's another good method that's something we'll talk about tomorrow um, which would, would completely change the way you do things um, so that that's pretty much it if you watch that again if you really wrap your head around how to use eccentric loading and isometric loading you will see massive improvements in your pull-ups and it may take time it may take you several weeks um, some people might even take several months but if you do good programming and you do twice a week and you um, work on the things we're going to teach you tomorrow you should be able to get a pull up within about 12 weeks yeah so do you maybe want to um, like we were just chatting before about the difference between you know using a band to assist yes versus yeah. well that's, doing the, that's what I was going to talk about with the big mistake so the big mistake that people make when they try to work on a pull-up is they use either a band or a, an assisted pull-up machine at the gym. And both of these, thi these things completely change the strength curve. So the band changes the strength curve by making it uh, easier at the bottom because the band helps you more at the bottom but then harder at the top. Um, and the assisted pull-up machine doesn't create a natural movement. It causes your body to move up and down in an unnatural way, which doesn't actually replicate a pull-up. Yeah, so just maybe a bit more on that strength curve idea. So when you're in that full range, so you're at the bottom of the, the pull-up, your muscles that they're at their most lengthened point. So they're actually, when with the muscle, they're strongest at the middle of the range because when you think about the muscle fibers, the way they contract is they go from be, having fibers that overlap a little bit and then as they contract, they go in. Yeah. And then as you lengthen, they come back out. And so when you're at the beginning, so that, that beginning of the range, you're not quite stretched over two joints for your biceps. So it's not true end range, but it's fairly end range. That's going to be um, the most challenging because you don't have as much overlap. So the more overlap you have, the stronger you are. So when you're training with a band, you're making the hardest, what would be the hardest bit now much easier. So mm -hmm. it means that you're still likely to have a real trouble initiating that first part of the pull up 
once you take the band away. So that's why um, we're talking about doing eccentrics here because you're building up that strength throughout the whole range and, um, and yeah. going from there. So. And you'll find when you do your eccentric contractions, most people are pretty good here and yep. then they get to about here and they just drop. Yep. So that's the part that you need to work on the most. Yep. When you do an eccentric contraction, the very last thing that should happen is that the scapulas elevate. So what that means is that you fully bring the arms straight above your head and then you let your shoulders go. That's the last thing that happens. Yep. So the other thing about um, where you're strongest is also in when you're in that total inner range, it, that's also uh, where you're not as strong because you've already contracted so much you can't go much further because there's just no more overlap to achieve. So just yeah. a bit more about that, that strength Yanni. curve idea. Yanni. Can you just help Simon quickly please before yeah. he goes? So we've got a question from Tommy here, Holy K Knight. So Tommy's saying, uh, relevant question, uh, DOMS, for those of you that don't know what that means, it means delayed onset of muscle soreness and recovery times usually uniform across all muscle groups or do certain muscles take longer to recover from DOMS than others? I'll let Phil answer this in a second uh, and after I tell you my experience. In my experience, it's just all the same. In my experience, the muscles that get the, the most hammered in the workout are the ones that are going to get the most DOMS, which means on a compound movement like a pull-up, that might be different. But in my experience, it's not like I can go, oh, wow, the DOMS in my biceps have gone but I've still got it in my lats. Um, yeah, spot on. It's more about loading so, um, and how much you've changed your load in a short amount of time. So, uh, you know, for Rich and I who have just got back into running a bit more recently, like we've really found that, you know, we've got really long lasting doms of our cars because uh, we've got stuck into it pretty quickly. And, um, uh, but the thing is like the, it's the change of activity, the change of loading that we're used to and the change of contraction type that is what causes the like intensity of DOMS rather than the muscle itself. So you might find, oh, you know, you get it in your quads more, but that's probably because, you know, a lot more of your exercises you're doing are quad dominant, especially, you know, long eccentrics in a slow squat, or then you're doing step ups and then you're doing lunges and then you're doing, you know, so it's more about that overall loading rather than like certain muscles are particularly prone to it. And certainly, yeah, um, muscles that are used to eccentrically contracting more in like everyday life so when you're walking down the stairs you're always eccentrically contracting your quads so they've kind of got a tolerance to it whereas you might find with your biceps you don't really spend that much time doing eccentric contractions for it so you might find this particularly intense because it's you know a much higher load and it's a a, a kind of movement that you're not used to so you're more likely to get it for a long time yeah yeah, awesome. Now, uh, if, you, uh, if you're watching, guys, please hit the like button and leave a comment with your name and where you're watching from so we can give you a shout out or any questions. If you've got any questions, just like Tommy there, uh, put them in the comment yeah. section so we can He's also got another question here, which is, um, don't bands hinder your ability to stabilize? So, um, yeah, I think with that one, like, again, stabilize is pretty, like, the stabilizing is happening at different joints in different ways. Um, so it's, like, in many ways, it kind of might add like a, a different sort of stabilizing load, but it also will take away other ones. So I think that's less of an issue than... My, my, my input on that would be, and this is my opinion, this is, I haven't read anything about yeah. this, but the pull-up is a closed kinetic chain movement, which means that the end of your limbs, you, either your hands or your feet, are fixed in space, whilst the center of your mass is free to move in space, okay? So another example, uh, so an example of a clo of an open kinetic chain movement that trains the same muscles would be a lat pull-down, where you're at the gym and you hold onto the lat machine and your center of mass is fixed in space, but your limbs are free to move. Now, um, all of the closed kinetic chain movements that I can think of that are really good, like the squat and the deadlift, for example, or um, even a push-up, there is no assistance or um, anything that helps you out. And on the machines that do that, like for example, a hack squat, they're not favored by the strongest people in the world as a primary way of developing strength. They're always used to supplement their strength training. And I think there's a good reason for that. I think that closed kinetic chain movements, your body is meant to be free to move so that your body has to figure out how to stabilize itself and use the strength naturally. Mm. What do you think? Yep. I mean, that's my opinion. There's no, don't take that to the bank. <laughs> yeah. But that's my, yeah, uh, I, my, my input on that one. Yeah, I think like generally we're saying st stick low band, so it becomes yep. a bit of a moot point. Yep. yep. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at some of these great comments that we've had recently. So, um, there's one that I wanted to bring up from Bang the other day, which was about our, um, like asking about the lat strengthening exercises, and it's one that I've actually gone into a fair amount of detail, so if you're interested, go back and have a look at the full comment. But he's basically asked if a front tuck lever um, is a good alternative for a single arm um, dumbbell row. 
And so, for, for, do you want to quickly describe what a front tuck lever is? Yeah, so a front tuck lever is, it's a progression to a front lever, and it's where you hold onto a pull-up bar, and you pull yourself up, so now you're, if the pull-up bar is here, your spine is flat to the ground, and your knees are tucked into your chest, so it's a yeah. real isometric contraction on the lats, yeah. and the scapula uh, depressors and retractors as well. Yeah, so basically I've gone in and said, like, it's a very good, exercise if you're training calisthenics and that's what you want to improve but when you, like training is all about specificity so if you really want to get stronger in your concentric and eccentric contractions you got to train those if you want to get stronger in your isometric contractions you got to train those so with um, the front tuck lever although you're holding that isometric contraction of your lats you're not getting as much strength benefit in terms of the concentric as you would if you trained specifically um, that movement. So with a single arm dumbbell row, <coughs> you're getting that isometric and, uh, sorry, you're getting that concentric and eccentric contraction. So I've said that, yeah, basically the reason why you'd want to be using um, single arm dumbbell row is you can progressively overload, so you can change the amount of weight you're using, which makes it great for progression and regression, and you're training the particular type of movement, so that concentric and eccentric, whereas front tuck lever, it's really hard to regress because basically unless you can do it, like if you can't do it, it's really hard to kind of do it <laughs> yep. and then also it's just an isometric contraction which the only way you can keep overloading is by time whereas we want to build that powerful strength which comes from yeah, yeah practicing that yeah it's also that isometric contractions have been shown to only really develop strength in a 30 degree range of motion so when you hold an isometric contraction you'll be strong from here to here but it doesn't develop strength in a full pulling movement so we use um, it, it is definitely not a substitute for a uh, single arm bent over row um, also, there's a real classification difference in um, in training w between bent arm strength and straight arm strength, and the lever is considered a straight arm strength movement, whereas the row is considered a bent arm strength movement. So they there are carryovers between them, absolutely, um, but they're not substitute substitutable yeah. exercises. No, like, like. Yeah, not in not in the way that we tr uh, program the UMS anyway. So I hope that answers your just, question. Just quickly, there's a really really good question here, um, or. Um, uh, comment from JJ Malvarez and it's something that I haven't heard you guys talk about which is the concept of body composition when doing pull-ups and yep. how he's talking about the fact that he tried for, for a long time to do pull-ups could never do them and it wasn't until he got below 15% body fat that he started to be able to do pull-ups and now at 10% body fat he finds them much much easier and I think maybe share the example of um, you know Alistair or members of ours that have dropped 20 or 30 kilos who can do pull-ups but when you strap that body weight to that weight to them again they can't do one you know yep so you know if you're if you're carrying a few extra kilos or, or your body composition is at, um, I think that's pretty bang on uh, mm -hmm. probably for a man above 15% and for a woman above 20% uh, the likelihood of you being able to do good quality pull-ups is diminished severely. Yeah, 100%. Turn your light on, Yanni, so there's some light on your face. Um, so what Yanni's saying is absolutely true. We got uh, a couple of our members, when we were doing a workshop a while ago, there was there a man and a woman, um, both over the age of 40. Uh, the woman was actually in, is, is actually in her 50s, and they can both do pull-ups. Um, and we got them to strap so they've both lost a bit of weight since they've been here and we got them to strap the amount of weight that they've lost since they've been here on for the guy it was either 16 or 20 kilos and for the girl it was um about eight or ten or eight or 12 kilos both of them demonstrated a few multiple reps of pull-ups with body weight and then when they strapped that same amount of weight on they couldn't do one single rep and yeah absolutely if you are of our, if you are carrying excess body fat on your on your body, then all calisthenics is going to be hard. Any time that you try and control your own body weight, it's going to be very very hard to do. So if you really you know, if you want to learn how to master your body, then one of the first things that you really need to do is to look into your own body composition and the kind of foods that you're eating. That's like one of the first markers of health is just is being of a lean physique. Now, I get that there are some people that might be watching this and we always get people say, oh, but what about somebody that's suffering from this disease or that's suffering from that condition? From the research that I've read from people that have got PhDs in metabolic syndrome and in uh, metabolism, 
I'm told that those conditions only account for two to three percent of the population that has a genetic disadvantage when it comes to body composition. So if that's the case, then, uh, you know, I think a lot of people that are falling back on that are not being honest with themselves. And I think what the real problem is, is environmental, is that you're living in an environment that you're eating the wrong foods and you're not exercising the right ways in order to get yourself into a healthy body composition. And that's a whole you know, another topic, you know, but um, yeah, you really want to look into getting yourself to a healthy body weight um, before you start really trying to hammer um, these calisthenic skills because there's other exercises that you can do that are going to deliver a bigger bang for your buck um, when it comes to fat loss and general muscle tone than calisthenic skills. Yeah, but you know, there's still like the regressions can be a great way of building up body yeah. strength. So yeah, stick with it. And yeah. Just do what you're capable of doing in the safest way you can. And yeah. Yeah, yeah and get onto eating good food. Um, you know, get onto eating a whole food diet and cutting the crap out and, you know, doing uh, time delayed, time restricted eating where you're only eating for an eight hour window. And um, there's a lot of really great inf resource information resources out there that you can, you know, spend half an hour and know what to do. And, and it just comes down to discipline. You have to discipline yourself and you have to learn to say no you know it's funny to get um, really fit and really healthy it's actually less about what you're prepared to do and it's more about what you're prepared to give up uh, because the doing is not so hard it's the giving up that's the hard part um, yeah. have you got I'd any say we'd like uh, you know work with the professional on this if you need you know extra help there are plenty of people who are spending a lot of time you know, studying nutrition and other people to talk to about this. But um, one thing with exercise is that as soon as you start, you know, kicking goals and exercise, it's so much easier to then have like a positive mindset. There's so much evidence to show that exercise has a um, positive effect on your mental health. And when you have, you know, a, a, a better mental health space and it's much easier to kind of make those choices around food and, um, you know, food is often a bit of a coping mechanism. So the more you can kind of be consistently exercising, it's generally, you know, it's just going to be going up and up and up in that positive spiral and in the same way if you you know stop exercising and you know you start to feel like you're, you know even you know when I've had really you know bad injuries that have taken me out of the things I like to do it's just so hard to have that positive mindset and then you find that everything else once you get you know stressed in that downward cycle it makes everything harder so yep. you know the smarter you can train the more consistent you can train then it'll you know yep. be a self-fulfilling prophecy I think. Yep. I've got a question here that we've never had before, and it's very short. So I'm going to I'm going to throw this out there before we finish because we've got to wrap up now. And I want to throw this out to the community and see if you guys are interested to know this, uh, because if we get enough interest, as always, then we can do this as a topic. Because uh, Stephen Koenig, uh, Koenig Nick uh, has said, I'd love to know the best approach to minimal effort slash time for sustaining strength and flexibility. Looking forward to it. And I think that's a good question, and I'm happy to answer it if we get enough uh, in, um, uh, enthusiasm in it. If there's enough people want to know the answer to that, then we can help you out, because it's actually a hell of a lot less than what you would think, and it's something that we were just talking about in the gym before. So leave a comment, let us know if you're interested to know uh, how much time and effort is required to maintain the strength and flexibility that you've worked hard to gain. Um, thanks for watching everyone. If you haven't already, please hit the like button, uh, leave us a comment with a question or even just your name and where you're watching from so we can give you a shout out. And we will be back tomorrow to wrap this up, talking about uh, different overload techniques and different ways to progress and e and just to put together a whole workout that involves pull-ups so that you can get great results. And then That's, moving on to muscle-ups. Yeah, then muscle-ups for uh, Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And then and then golfers and tennis elbow. And then golfers and tennis elbow for next week. So we've got yeah. a couple of uh, great weeks of shows coming up for you thanks as always for tuning in enjoy your training and we will see you tomorrow health is about performance not just body image you better be willing to accept what you're going to have to do to get there we'll start focusing on movement goals strength goals flexibility goals when you nail that skill it's there forever the body image goal doesn't get you that it's the consistency and frequency that's going to get you there it's not the intensity there's no shortcuts to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. The gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image.